Today, we're taking a look at the Saunders Kittywake, which was only the second aircraft fully designed by the company, the first being a little-known biplane from the First World War called the Saunders T-1. This aircraft was a product of the tumultuous years that immediately followed the war. This was a time when the aviation industry was trying to justify its existence in the civil market as the new form of transport, to compete with the long-established train and shipping services. In early 1920, the Air Ministry had announced a competition that would be held between August and September to encourage the development of civil transports with this very goal in mind. This competition was open to both land planes and amphibians, and Saunders organised a team to prepare an entry for the latter, believing that amphibious aircraft would be more competitive. It was designed by a man called F.P. Hyde Beadle, who had recently joined Saunders, and with the assistance of two other Saunders designers, roughly 6,000 design drawings were completed over a six-week period during the summer of 1920. The result was the Kittywake, and it was a remarkably adventurous design for what was meant to be the company's first real attempt at a civil transport. The most striking feature of the Kittywake was its hull, which made it appear rather ugly, and the three-deck arrangement of said hull, with a raised cockpit and a cabin, also made the aircraft appear top-heavy. The middle and upper sections served as crew and passenger cabins, with the raised position providing better visibility for the pilots when they were on the water. The enclosed cockpit, a very novel feature for the time, had side-by-side -side seating for two pilots, and an internal stairway connected it to the passenger cabin which could accommodate up to seven additional people. Access for the passengers was provided by a companion ladder on the starboard side, and the pilots could either enter in this way or use a small hatch on the roof of the cockpit. Having the cabins mounted above the hull was not only good for visibility, but it also allowed them to be detachable from the hull, so that if damaged it could be easily replaced. Additionally, it freed up space within the hull to accommodate the undercarriage without compromising cabin space for either the passengers or the pilots. The main wheels were raised using a hand crank that was operated by the flight engineer, who probably had the world's strongest forearm, and because of their location they had a very narrow track. This was not considered much of an issue, as the Kittywake would spend most of its time on the water, as opposed to land, but they did provide enough stability for taxiing about on the ground if needed. The wings of the Kittywake were as unique as the hull. They featured a camber changing mechanism which caused almost the entire leading and trailing edges of both wings to move. These leading and trailing edge flaps were operated simultaneously through a single control, and the added lift provided by this arrangement was intended to offset the relatively high takeoff loads. When fully laden, the Kitty Wake was to weigh 6,200 pounds, or approximately 2,800 kilos but it was only powered by a pair of 200 horsepower 7-cylinder wasps driving two-blade propellers. This would normally be considered underpowered, but using the variable camber system, the speed of the Kitty Wake was designed to range from 40 miles an hour at the stall, to a cruising speed of 90 miles an hour, and up to a maximum speed of 120 miles an hour. Though not a blistering pace by today's standards, this estimated top speed was impressive for the time, especially as the Kitty Wake was by no means small. But for all its innovations, the design of this flying boat also forced some compromises. Because the trailing edge cambering mechanism ran almost to the full length of the wing, the ailerons had to be installed between the upper and lower wings, being mounted behind the two outermost of the interplane struts. The latter of these was also used to support the two wing floats when on the water, and this meant that in rough conditions, the impact of the waves on the floats could transfer through the struts and possibly interfere with the ailerons. But this being 1920, there was no real way to simulate much of this in tests, and Saunders had to simply design the floats to absorb as much of the impact as possible until the aircraft could get onto the plane of the water, at which point the floats would be clear. As with many pioneering aircraft, the Kitty Wake story isn't a particularly happy one. The construction of the Kitty Wake was hampered by the novelty of its design, as a number of problems had to be overcome, which caused delays. As a result of this, it was completed too late to compete in the Air Ministry competition. 
However, it was still felt that the design was as good, if not better, than the other entrants of the competition, in no small way due to the camber changing devices on the wings, which gave it a greater speed range at heavy loads. Thus, expectations were still high for it as a commercial aircraft. The Kitty Wake began its water trials on the 11th of September 1920. Test pilot Norman McMillan had also intended to fly that day, but during the trials the undercarriage would not fully retract, courtesy of a missing locking pin, and he had to content himself with engine and hydrodynamic tests. The Kitty Wake finally flew on the 19th of September, again with McMillan at the controls, and the performance during takeoff was good, with no signs of porpoising, however at a height of 600 feet the inboard section of the starboard lower leading edge flap was torn away from its spar. The Kitty Wake then yawed violently to starboard as a result of this, but happily, and unhappily, a few moments later the instability was partially corrected by the failure of the port side leading edge flap as well. McMillan brought the aircraft down as fast as possible, but just a few feet from the water it stalled out completely, and came down just hard enough that it struck the submerged reef of Egypt Point. It promptly took on water and sank to the level of the lower wing roots. The Kitty Wake was quickly recovered and put in for repairs. The damage to the hull turned out to be slight and was no challenge, but almost the entire leading edge camber mechanism had failed, which required more attention. The aircraft was repaired and the flaps were reinforced with a system of tabs and wires that were designed to hold them more firmly in place. It was then the engine's turn to be the source of Saunders' daily headaches. When trials resumed on the 27th of September, the aircraft now appeared to be down on power and refused to take off. When the engines were inspected more closely, it was found that they had been produced by two different facilities. The starboard engine was a handmade pre-production example, but the port engine was a subcontracted production unit and it barely managed 1500 RPM. In addition to this, it was found that the undercarriage failed after a prolonged period of static load, not exactly useful, and it was then found that the interplane ailerons were ineffective at small angles of deflection. Basically, a lot of things had gone wrong all at once. Further flight testing was delayed for over six months while all of this was addressed, however the problem of low power continued, and it failed to meet what would soon be the standard requirement for civil aircraft. Crews at half power to ensure economy and reliability, but sufficient power reserves for takeoff and emergencies. Ultimately, the Kitty Wake was too experimental to be ensured of any real success. After all, a three-decked flying boat with adjustable leading and trailing edge flaps in 1921? In the immediate post-war years, reliability and economy was far more important than innovation, and in fact this was the crucial period in which the aircraft industry as a whole had to prove itself as a useful and vital tool rather than a novelty, which had been their view before the war. Because of the disappointing trials, there was almost no commercial interest for the Kitty Wake, and after it crashed at Cowes in 1921, the decision was made to scrap it. Shortly after this, Hyde Beadle, the main designer, left Saunders, and it was not until 1923 that a new design team was established. This team would have better luck. Coming in as the underdog in a market that was being dominated by Short Brothers, Supermarine and Blackburn. But that is a story for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, with whom I've been recently discussing some top secret plans for the channel, and a special shout out of course to the Wing Commander tier patrons as well, the top tier members of this illustrious club. Now some of these plans will be made public in the semi near future, so keep an eye out for that. I'm incredibly excited for what's coming and hopefully I'll have some stuff ready to share within the next few weeks, time and my health permitting, this lingering cough is still being a pain. But thank you all so much as always, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.